Thank you very much, Ronnie. Um, thanks very much for having me here today. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I think I've got the hardest job today because I just have to follow that and that was so good. Um, and um, I'll try my best. I hope you don't expect me to start acting out the stories of George Mackay Brown as a kind of one woman show. I just don't think I'd inflict that on you and I certainly wouldn't sing at you either. What I'm going to do today actually is talk about six of George Mackay Brown's short stories and that's the six that have made their way uh, onto the list of Scottish texts to be used in the Higher English course. And I think that the decision to include these stories in the curriculum really seems to be a part of a new wave of interest in George Mackay Brown, who I think today is coming to be regarded as one of the finest writers and poets of 20th century Scotland. Since the publication of Brown's collected poems in 2005 and a saltire award-winning biography of Brown by Maggie Ferguson in 2006, his life and writing have attracted a score of new critical reappraisals and reviews and there are now new editions of nearly all of his major works of short stories and his novels by the publisher Polygon Berlin. Brown is by now I think Orkney's best known writer um, and he's kind of stolen the crown from the previous prince of Orkney writing, the poet, academic and critic Edwin Muir. Um, who just happens to have been Brown's mentor and friend, a critical influence on the younger poet Brown uh, as he developed his own creative skills in the 1940s. But in case you've missed some of this new interest in Brown, it might be worth me just noting a wee bit about his life and putting his work into some kind of literary context and talking about it kind of thematically and stylistically today. So Brown was born in 1921 in the small seaport of Stromness in Orkney. Um, he was the seventh child of John Brown, a tailor and postman, and Mary Sheena Mackay, who came to Stromness from the Highlands, aged 19, to work in the new big Stromness Hotel. Brown's father died when he was just 18, and he lived with his mother um, until she died when he was 45 years old. So very much like Ian Crichton-Smith, he was looked after by his mammy because he wasn't very well. He was a kind of sickly man. Brown was uh, really, he spent long periods of time in sanatoriums and hospitals recuperating during his 20s. And it's during this time that he hones his creative skills really and he begins to call himself the horizontal bard. And apart from local journalism, during this time, um, he really held down no other jobs at all throughout his 20s. However, when he was 29 and he'd recuperated a bit, he left Orkney for the first time to study at New Battle Abbey College in Dalkeith, near Edinburgh. That's where you're from. <laughs> um, and uh, he then later on studied at the University of Edinburgh. He studied English literature there and began postgraduate research on the poetry of the Catholic convert and Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. He didn't finish that incidentally, so I think there's a lesson there. If you start postgraduate work, don't finish it, go on and become a very successful writer. <laughs> I should have done that. Um, in fact, in 1961, Brown too converted to Catholicism. That's a really important part of his biography, I think, and one that I'll talk about a bit today. By the time he converted in 1961, he'd gone back uh, to Orkney to live and write full time. And his first poetry collection, The Storm and other poems had been published in 1954. Um, Edwin Muir, um, who'd been the warden of New Battle Abbey, had really taken up the role of mentor for Brown and had helped him by sending a selection of his poems to the famed London publishing house, the Hogarth Press. Um, so these poems were accepted and they were published as a second poetry collection in 1959. This was Loaves and Fishes. So Brown's career really began with poetry um, and it took off when he was quite a mature man in his late thirties. Brown's work is characterised by both the bare lean style he learned from the medieval Icelandic sagas and also by a lusher decorative Celtic element, which he believed he inherited um, from his mother's Highland Gaelic speaking ancestry. 
he was really ashamed that he hadn't gone to see the TV at the Stag and the Black Black Oil when it came to Orkney and he think he should have been ashamed, he really missed out obviously. Um, but his work is highly evocative and symbolic in all the lit literary forms that he adopts. His short stories are perhaps, I think, his finest works. But he also produced five novels to great critical acclaim. So Magnus, uh, the novel of 1973 was the Hogarth Press's Booker Prize submission for that year, while Beside the Ocean of Time was shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 1994, although that was famously won by James Kelman. Brown also published several volumes of poetry, plays, some children's stories and volumes of his collected journalism. So Brown weaves his fictional and poetic universe, as Seamus Heaney has said, through the eye of the needle of Orkney. His characters are Orkney's crofters, fishermen, monks, vikings and tinkers. And his vision is a sacramental one, both deeply spiritual and deeply physical. He writes in an Orkney tapestry, which is his kind of fusion of poetry, prose, ballad and personal polemic, that in the web of being, spiritual and corporal are close woven. The possibility of grace is always present in George Mackay Brown's short fiction. And in his work, he consecrates the labours of Orkney's agricultural workers. His major and recurrent themes are the value of the past, the elemental community, and small community becomes kind of a microcosm for the wider world in his work. Uh, the deep worth of art, and storytelling and the need for sacrifice. Much admired by Seamus Heaney, Cecil Day Lewis and of course Edwin Muir, Brown's poetry and prose is scattered with sea pinks, smattered by stars and he often emphasises what he calls the web of creation, so the connectedness of all things by God's hand and he laments when this web is breached or broken by violence and conflict. And that isn't to say that there aren't lots of really good bar brawls in his work. There's lots of fights. In fact, his mother's review of his first collection of short stories, A Calendar of Love, was it's all about pubs and drinking. And actually, it kind of is. That's part of the reason it's really good. So George Mackay Brown's often read as being part of a second wave of the so-called Scottish uh, cultural renaissance. And of course, he's immortalised in Alexander Moffat's painting, Poets Pub, in which a group of this movement's most prodigious and influential poets sit drinking in one of Edinburgh's Rose Street bars in the 1950s. There have been accusations of parochialism or narrow-minded regionalism in Brown's work. So, for example, Douglas Gifford has written that Brown's case is the sad one of a truly great writer who has chosen to live in a room with one view from its single window. However, Brown is situated at the very heart of Sandy Moffat's painting and this affirms his status which I think has become recognised today that he is one of the key writers of the Renaissance movement. His interest in Orkney's Norse ancestry and the island's inheritance uh, linguistically and culturally from Viking Scandinavia mean, means that he is really a part of this movement but his work also goes beyond the parameters of the Renaissance and into a postmodern world, for he outlived many of his Renaissance contemporaries and was publishing work until his death in 1996. Brown's allegiance to Orkney as the setting for all of his short stories um, and longer fiction has been a really strong selling point in his image, and he's most often visually presented as a remote islander. Critics have frequently labelled him a modern day bard, uh, scald or antiquarian um, who's dedicated to recording and imaginatively recreating the history and culture of the Orkney archipelago. And to an extent Brown colluded in this branding. Despite his notoriously shy and at times reclusive uh, nature outside of his immediate social circle, he was willing to be photographed um, within the landscape of his native islands. So by placing Brown among fields of ripening corn um, and even showing him working outside at a little desk beside the sea, which is definitely not where he actually did work, um, photographers showed that his location was a really integral part of his writing process um, and inspiration.
So I want to talk today quite generally about the stories in A Time to Keep, Brown's second short story collection from 1969, in which this antiquarian impulse can be felt very keenly and in which he makes frequent references to the landscape, uh, traces of dialect, history and people of the Orkney Islands. So A Time to Keep was really a, a critical and commercial success for Brown and it was the natural successor to his first collection of short fiction which is populated by Presbyterian fishermen, drunken crofters and 16th century reformers who stalk menacingly across its pages. And some Orcadians were really rather unhappy with this collection. They felt that it portrayed Orkney in a very old fashioned uh, retrograde and even kind of seedy light. And this is particularly the, the case in 1971 when three of these stories were dramatised by the BBC for their Play for Today series. Um, and certainly some of these stories don't shy away from difficult issues, including things like addiction, particularly alcoholism and grief. But the response to A Time to Keep, I think, has really mellowed over time. Um, and it's now generally regarded as some of the best writing that Brown produced over his entire career. Characters in these tales show stoicism in the face of pain, loss and grief and tragedy. And although this stoicism may at first seem like insensitivity or callousness, Brown's characters have had to develop a really tough exterior uh, to survive tragic events. So A Time to Keep represents Brown's going, growing confidence in and mastery of the short story form. Um, and of course it's the stories from this collection that are on the list of set Scottish texts for hire. So I'm going to start and really focus mostly I suppose on what I think is my favourite of George Mackay Brown's short stories. Um, and this is the title story from the collection, It's A Time to Keep Itself. This is one of the stories that was later dramatised by Bill Forsyth for the BBC. Um, and I'm going to focus on this because I think in this story you see what Brown does best in his short fiction. So it's the story of Bill, a crofter fisherman, um, who at the beginning of the tale describes his walk home from his wedding with his new wife, Ingy. And Bill says that he is an unpopular fisherman and it's really not difficult to see why. Um, he's pretty taciturn and not easy to like initially. And A Time to Keep shows the difficulty that Bill faces in trying to wrench a living from the land and sea of Orkney in the 1950s. While Bill is often lucky at fishing, he is an unlucky crofter. And in one particularly devastating storm, his entire crop is destroyed. Life is no less easy for his wife, Ingy who gathers peats, collects water from the burn, smokes fish, bakes, scrubs the floor and tries to mend creels. So we're really dealing with a very agricultural community in this story. Ingy waits patiently in the doorway of the croft for Bill every evening uh, when he comes home and if the weather is bad she scans the shoreline for his boat. So she's a kind of symbol of constancy and faithfulness in contrast to the fickle weather and dangerous sea. Ingy is, in contrast to Bill, a model Christian, and she goes faithfully to church each Sunday. Bill's two saints, on the other hand, uh, are Tom Payne and Robert Burns, suggesting that his admiration is reserved for figures that he considers to be politically democratic, um, or democratic and politically radical, rather than pious or devout. He's also very fond of ale, much like his author, and much to the consternation of Ingy's father, uh, who is extremely disapproving and a very respectable merchant from Kirkwall. In any case, the story's main vein of tragedy uh, culminates in Ingy's death in childbirth. Her best friend Anna suggests to Bill that they marry and look after his new baby together, but instead of accepting this offer, he shouts at her and takes his new child to the shoreline where he performs a kind of secular christening, telling the child be honest, be against all darkness, fight on the side of life, be against ministers, lairds, shopkeepers, be brave always. For me, one of this story's major themes is signalled initially by its title, A Time to Keep. This might surprise us at first because despite our narrator's seemingly very strident atheism, 
uh, this is a biblical quotation taken from Ecclesiastes, which tells us, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And the extract from this scriptural passage, I think, tells us something quite important about Brown's short story. These scriptural words point to the major thematic idea of life's recurring patterns in the valley, the valley in which Bill and Ingy live, love and work. The idea of a pattern is highlighted throughout the structure of this short story, as the story is told over 12 sections, suggesting, I think, 12 months. And indeed, the story begins with Bill looking at the snowy hills and it ends with him reflecting that in the morning, the valley would be a white blank. In fact, George Mackay Brown is really fond of numbers and uh, symbolism to do with, with uh, numerology. We see this often in his work. He's really fond of the number seven and the number three as kind of patterns or structuring devices. And he also uses the Stations of the Cross or rosaries as kind of convenient structural frames. <coughs> Brown sets up the idea of a time or a season for everything in this story. So childbirth, death, planting and harvesting crops, laughing and mourning, just as the quotation from Ecclesiastes suggests. And Brown sets his tale then within a Christian framework. He uses a biblical title for this story because he believes that all of this points to a creator who watches over humanity and loves and grieves along with every human person. The title A Time to Keep suggests that we shouldn't be anxious about the events of life because God has decided that there's a time or a season for everything. All will eventually be well. And obviously another then very strongly connected theme is that of faith. Bill and Ingy very differ very often in their views of religion. This is explored quite sensitively by Brown. We know that Ingy believes in God. Before she eats, she says a small quiet prayer over her food um, and she goes to church dutifully. On the other hand, Bill is a sure atheist, as I said. He describes the words of the island missionary as a fairy tale. However, Bill cannot really help but, dis <laughs> but imagine the world in religious terms. When he's fishing, he looks back at the land and he imagines the sea in the land as a blue and a green hand. And he reflects, blue hand and green hand lay together, like praying in the summer dawn. He's also bombarded with religious imagery in Orkney's landscape throughout this short story. So on Good Friday, which is obviously the day when the, the Lamb of God is crucified, Bill finds two of his lambs have been born dead. And he looks at his land and thinks, no one on God's earth could plough such a wilderness. So in this way, Brown has his character fight belief um, against belief in a Christian God, but he can't really escape this belief. The language of faith enters his vocabulary and Christian imagery shapes his imagination. When Bill talks of his crop, he says, my oats had heaved at the sun like a great slow green wave all summer. Now the sun had blessed it. The whole field lay brazen and burnished under a sweep of blue sky, and the wind blessed it continually, sending long murmurs of fulfilment, whispers, secrets through the thickly congregated stalks. So in this description, the fruit of the sea and earth's bounty are conflated. A maritime simile transforms the field of corn into a slow green wave. And this is the language of belief then. The sun and the wind bless the crop, which is full of thickly congregated stalks and the crop is transformed into a congregation, sending prayers to and receiving blessings from the elements. So there are shades of two of Brown's great literary heroes in this writing, I think, um, both of uh, Francis Thompson, the Victorian poet, and Graham Greene, the novelist. And I think the idea of the wayward sinner pursued relentlessly um, by Christ, the hound of heaven, is really um, at work in this short story, definite nods to those influences through that theme. But for me, aside from the kind of religious reading that you can do of the short story, um, Bill is one of Brown's great characters. He is richly complex and full of nuance. And I love the way that he mentions the word alone for the, in his description of his fishing trip five times at the opening of the story. That's just how very kind of alone and taciturn he is. But despite his outward surliness, 
Bill loves his new wife, Ingy, very deeply. He tells us, I didn't feel the need of anyone except Ingy. So it's difficult not to admire or at least respect our narrator, Bill, who stands firm in the, fa the face of pressure. He doesn't cringe in the face of bigger, more powerful forces. And despite the accusations by Ingy's father that he is a drunkard and an atheist, he's at least one of these things, <laughs> Bill's tendency towards his wife and child and the grief he displays after Ingy's death are indicative of a gentler side to his personality. In fact, um, death is probably one of the, the big uh, thematic strands running through this entire short story collection. Um, and we can see this in another of these stories from A Time to Keep the Bright Spade. Um, the first sentence of this story introduces the gravedigger Jacob, who that winter was the busiest man in all the island. The narrative then lists a catalogue of deaths in the island, um, and for each death we're told the name of the deceased, um, where they're from, and what their relatives can pay Jacob for his services. As a hard winter progresses and a famine begins, Jacob is increasingly in demand to bury the island dead. Notably, he buries seven crewmen from a wrecked ship and also seven of the island community's strongest men as they walk through drifts of snow in order to try and gather dulse for the island's hungry people. The story ends in March as the islanders bring out their rusty ploughs to prepare the earth for planting of crops. So again, we have that idea of the kind of cyclical nature of the agricultural community that we saw in the past short story. And Jacob prays that his spade, which is bright from all its employment, will not be required again until after spring and harvest time. In another of the short stories from this collection, The Wireless Set, Brown's subject is the onset of the Second World War. And this is heralded by the arrival of the first wireless set for the valley people in a, a sort of fictional valley called Tronvik. The people of Tronvik, um, particularly the central characters, an old couple called Hugh and Betsy, listen greedily to Lord Haw Haw, the English voice on the wireless, which spreads Nazi propaganda intended to demoralise the British audience. One night everyone listens as Lord Haw Haw reports starvation in Britain. Um, Betsy thrusts her frying, plan, her frying pan under the nose of the wireless, angry at the report. The people turn off the programme and they eat, drink and tell stories long into the night. In the final part of this story, the island postman delivers a telegram to Betsy who's listening to music on the wireless. On reading the telegram, she discovers that her son Howie is dead. When Hugh, her husband, returns to the croft, he knows already without having to be told that his son has been killed in the war and he takes an axe into the barn and destroys the wireless. So this story's major theme is really that of encroaching modernity and loss of innocence. The older people in the valley of Tronvik possess a kind of folk wisdom, um, an older type of knowledge of land and seasons. For example, Hugh can predict the weather far more accurately than can a formal weather report because he's so intuitive. He's always been a fisherman and he's in, in tune with patterns of nature and weather. Um, and Betsy also notes that he knows of a, the truth of a thing generally before a word is uttered. So the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939 at the beginning of the story coincides with new technology coming to Tronvik. After the folk in Betsy and Hughes Croft hear the lies that are broadcast about starvation, they comfort themselves with typically Orcadian bloody puddings, buttered bannocks, and ale. You'll notice ale recurs quite frequently in the stories. And they tell each other stories that had nothing to do with war until two o'clock that morning. So this is an agricultural society again, which is, which is emerging from an older way of life with traditions of storytelling and older patterns of speech than those heard in the wireless. And new technology disrupts this utterly. Uh, the world has changed completely and the valley cannot escape this change. And then, of course, another connected theme is that of progress. While we might initially think that Howie's generous gift to the people of Tronvik um, will bring some kind of advancement or improvement to their lives, in fact, symbolically, the wireless brings war and thus death into the valley directly. And disapproval of progress is really one of George Mackay Brown's most keenly felt themes, and it's something for which he has often been criticised. He felt that the veneration of newer and more complicated forms of technology often blinded people to the value of older customs and traditions and ways of life. He writes elsewhere that progress is a goddess 
who up to now has looked after her children well. The sky is scored with television aerials. I feel that this religion is in great part a delusion and will peter out in the marsh. At the end of the story, it becomes clear that in some way Hugh feels this too and that he associates the wireless with his son's death. So Hugh, Hugh and Betsy, the story's central characters, are really old country folk. They're from an era that's changing rapidly, from one of agrarian life and customs to an increasingly mechanised future. They use laconic, understated speech throughout, but it's their silence concerning Howie's death and Hugh's sudden act of violence which speaks most about their grief. They take comfort in the rituals of fishing and agriculture which they've grown up with and which kind of fortify their existence. Elsewhere in this collection there is a story, The Eye of the Hurricane, another story about unresolved grief and alcoholism and actually come to think of it, George Mackay Brown is a bit morbid in this collection. Um, I thought it was his later collection, Hawkfall, that was meant to be the one where he meditates solemnly on death, um, but in this one he's just as obsessed. However, this collection also contains much lighter notes, including the short story The Whaler's Return, which is a comic tale, thank God, about a rather gentle man called Flaws. Um, who tries to make his way from Hamnevo. This is the old Viking name for Stromness, where Brown was from. He tries to make his way from Hamnevo to Bursi, which is a kind of ancient seat of medieval Viking power in Orkney. And the critic Alan Bold has written that Brown told him that one of his favourite dodges, or I guess the kind of easy narrative structures, was to um, have a character go from one place to another with five stopping places in between. Um, pretty crafty. So in this short story, Flaws attempts to make his way to Bursi in spite of the temptation of 34 ale houses in Hamnevo <laughs> and 16 on the road between Hamnevo and Bursi. I mean, that would be difficult for anyone to avoid, I think. And at the end of what Bold calls this boozy odyssey, Flaws reaches his Penelope, or Petarina, and lives happily, though without much money, ever after. The last story that I want to mention is Tartan, and it's quite different in tone, style and setting to the other uh, five stories that I've nodded to today. Um, and it's broadly comic, so it's probably a good place to finish. The story opens in completely sparse, bare idiom and style um, in terms of its nods to the medi medieval Icelandic, Icelandic sagas, and it tells us this. They anchored the eagle off the rock in shallow water between the horns of a white sandy bay. It was a windy morning. Behind the bay stretched a valley of fertile farms. We will visit those houses, said Arnor the helmsman. Olaf, who was, about, who was the skipper that voyage, said that he would bide on the ship. He had a poem to make about rounding Cape Roth that would keep him busy. Four of the Vikings, Arnor, Havard, Call Sven, we did assure they carried axes in their belts. So, so far, so menacing. Um, these Vikings are making a raid on Caithness, and while we might be forgiven for expecting a story, a kind of blood story of pillaging and murder, what we actually get is quite different. Like the story of Yorkel Hayforks from Brown's first uh, collection, A Calendar of Love, which deals with completely inept and quite drunk Vikings. This lot are not much better. Um, the most intimidating of their number, Col, ends up dead in a ditch with his throat cut. And because of the shrewd manoeuvring of the Highlanders, um, all that the slightly tipsy Vikings manage to take home with them um, is a length of tartan weave and a couple of sheep. So even their court poet has failed and he announces solemnly, the poem has two good lines out of seven. I will work on it when I get home to Rousey. So Brown is using Old Norse Icelandic literature here as a stylistic model, I think. In particular, he mimics the narrative tone and style and method of Orkney and Gasaga, the history of the medieval Viking Earls of Orkney, which was written in Iceland in around the 12th century. And this is one of the most important influences on Brown's writing. He discovered it in his 20s and it changed everything for him. Not only did the saga's tales of the Vikings and their terrible deeds appeal to Brown's imagination, but the manner in which the saga is told was really interesting to him. Its stories are based on real historical material about Orkney's past rulers and on an oral tradition of storytelling. Its language is, as I say, unadorned. You'll find no excessively decorative uh, description within its pages, 
and it tells stories of Viking seafaring, battle, murder and heroism um, uh, on the seas. And we can see that exact same kind of narration in Tartan. The lean narrative style is particularly noticeable in the sagas when characters meet their deaths. Um, in Orkney Inga saga, when Vikings are killed, they often say something really witty or sarcastic as they die. And this is to show their bravery and lack of fear as they face often, often gruesome, grisly ends. Um, in Tartan, Brown kind of ironises this saga trope so that before Cole dies, uh, full of ale that he's demanded from one of the Highlanders. Um, he, he tries to make a kind of witty quip, um, but instead he says, he staggers against the door and he says, doubtless someone will pay for this, he said thickly. So the Vikings are not really a fearsome threat in this short story. After they've drunk lots of Ma Malcolm the Highlander's ale um, and he generously offers them a length of tartan, Sven says defensively, we were going to take it in any case. So they're a bit rubbish, rubbish Vikings. So this, this sort of rounds up really what I want to say about Brown's short stories and a time to keep. There's an awful lot more to say about these tales. And of course, it's difficult to talk about them without giving you lots of plot summary. Um, you'll have noticed that Brown frequently alternates between the narrative terseness of the Icelandic sagas and that more decorative lyrical style that I mentioned at the beginning. Often the grief and loss that characters face is articulated by this tough, bare prose, which excludes any description other than that which is absolutely necessary. On the other hand, Brown's Orcadian landscapes are often described in really lush language, with sun-burnished corn reaching towards nature's blue hemisphere in which the lark sings joyfully. Brown's characters recur over time, and you'll notice that in this collection. Uh, they are seafarers, lovers, gossips, ghosts, priests, and they're nourished by the primitive wholesome sources, the sea and the land, living according to the essentials of life in an agricultural community. The agricultural year's wheel of fruitfulness sustains these characters, but they also face danger at sea, ruined crops, poverty and loss. And Brown always makes the outsider, or the figure most marginalised by respectable society, uh, the most heroic. He has no patience for the polite social mores of uh, the kind of arbiters of polite society. And despite his own deep religious faith, he has most sympathy for the drunkard, the atheist, and the disreputable woman. So these stories derive great strength linguistically and thematically from Orkney's long history, Catholicism, agriculture, folktale, literature, and lore. And this, I think, is part of the reason why Brown is now the most famous of Orkney writers. And in his short stories, he imagines the islands like no other. Thanks.